and gentlemen. Uh... Can I please have your attention? Can you dig it? Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Got an exciting, we, we called an audible and said, you know, we really should do a remnant about this. And, but of course, Kevin Williamson is on the road. So I cannot, I cannot see his lovely visage uh, on this podcast. Normally I can at least tell whether people are eye rolling at me. Now I'll just have to deduce it from his tone. Uh, Kevin had a monster of a piece up at the dispatch yesterday. We're recording this on Tuesday, September 17th, called The Exotic Cat Eaters of Springfield, Ohio. A pretty long story about a thing that didn't happen. Kevin, welcome back to The Remnant. Hey, I'm not going to make a who canceled joke because I think I actually was on the list this time. So that's... Uh... Yeah, when, when we say we've got to have Kevin Williamson on, you are our first choice of guests to fill the Kevin Williamson slot. The first Kevin Williamson among all the Kevin Williamson's. Well, there actually are several of us. You know, there's the, the famous screenwriter too. You might want to have him on at some point. But uh, I wouldn't mind having him on. I think he'd be great. And the Scottish politician's a pretty interesting guy too. I, I can't really ask you the what's your article about kind of thing, <laughs> uh, given the title and all that. But uh, let's let's let's... Let's pretend that some listeners haven't read it and uh, weren't drawn to it from Joe Scarborough's fawning praise for it on Twitter or anybody else's. I've had to defend you from some from detractors that we don't need to talk about while recording. Why don't you just sort of like tell us what the piece is about, what your thinking was, all that kind of stuff, and we'll take it from there. Well, there's this interesting situation in Springfield, Ohio, which is a relatively small city. I uh, was around 50 to 55,000 people. And it's had a large number of Haitian immigrants move there uh, between 12 and 15,000. Some estimates run higher, although that's um, the official numbers are around there. And they're there on temporary protected status from the U.S. government, which means they have work permits and stuff. As you might imagine, that many immigrants from a very poor country that is culturally very different from the United States, say nothing of different from uh, small cities in Rust Belt, Ohio, there have been some tensions. But the way the tensions have played out is through the presidential election with these bizarre, completely made up stories that these Haitians are going around kidnapping people's cats and dogs uh, and eating them. And I really thought that the dog eating story was um, was really Trump trying to get back in your good graces. Finally, you know, that he was going to be the champion of protecting dogs against people who would uh, would do the mail. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a completely made up story. But um it has shut down this uh, this poor little city. The schools are closed down because there's all these bomb threats. Local college is closed. They have some big annual um, like music and cultural festival that I guess has been canceled. Um, it's going to you know really 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 hurt this community. And um, it's it's a dumb thing in two ways. It's dumb because it is as the headline says a thing that is not happening. Uh, it's just a completely made up BS story. But it also means that people aren't really able to talk in a serious, responsible way about the actual problems and challenges associated with that much immigration into a, in a place that small. It should be noted that um, that um, a number of cities, including uh, Springfield, have been for years trying to recruit immigrants to move there in large numbers because they had a declining population and the declining economy that goes along with that. It wasn't a super prosperous place. And the Haitians, although they are, you know, from a very poor place, and of course they remain uh, relatively low income folks, are actually doing pretty well there. There's a big warehousing industry uh, because you have Amazon and other companies around there. And I wrote a big, actually, I wrote a big profile about the Amazon facility in, um, I guess it's Sparta uh, nearby a couple of years ago for uh, for National Review. It's an interesting business. So these, you know, these Haitians are, are working and they like to work and they like to work over time. I talked to uh, a friend of the dispatch who um, runs a big manufacturing company there. Um, they make brakes and axles for big trucks. And he says that he routinely loses his Haitian employers, employees because he can't offer them enough overtime. Uh, they just want to work and they're buying houses and things. And they've really contributed to um, turning the economy around their son. And uh, this is, in, in one sense, a success story. But then it's also, in another sense, um, the sort of tension you would expect from this. So there's competition over things like housing. Housing prices have gone up. Uh, people who used subsidized housing voucher programs have found it more difficult to get a place because places have been brought into the market priced, you know, regular free market alternative. So from a 
from the point of view of people who used to call themselves conservatives until the day before yesterday, we go, huh, a bunch of people move to an area, get jobs, work really hard, start buying houses, and they pull assets out of the welfare state in the competitive economy. That sounds like a pretty good win for everybody. Uh, but of course, some people got their noses been out of shape about it. And this is J.D. Vance's backyard. You know, he's from uh, from Middletown, which is not too far from there. And I was actually coming up from uh, from down around Pulaski, uh, Virginia. So I was coming through the Appalachian Mountains and I was sort of um, thinking to myself as I was driving up that I was kind of retracing the uh, the route that a lot of uh, J.D. Vance's hillbilly antecedents followed going to the same place. Now, his people came from Kentucky, not from Virginia and West Virginia, but, you know, same mountain, same kind of route. And when you start to think about it, the parallels there are really kind of interesting. You know, when the people from Appalachia started moving to the factory towns, there were stories about them eating weird animals like, you know, squirrels and possums and things like that. They were not very educated. They didn't speak English well. Uh, they didn't understand the local culture. They didn't fit in very well, but they were still competing for jobs and that kind of stuff. You know, these these Haitians are sort of the, the hillbillies of the Caribbean, in a sense. And it's, it's probably worth keeping in mind also that the people moving from Appalachia to the factory towns were moving from one of the poorest places in the Western Hemisphere at the time. Probably in absolute terms poorer than Haiti is now, uh, simply because we live in a richer world in which there's more aid and and uh, just kind of more to go around. So they're very similar stories. And you would think that of all people, J.D. Vance um, would have a more kind of nuanced view and maybe even some appreciation for these folks. But of course, J.D. Vance has decided to become the most despicable human being in American public life for this cycle. So, uh most despicable human being in American public life for this cycle. We can we'll put a pin in that. Um, well, let's talk about because, it for a second because I I take very I take very seriously the prohibition against bearing false witness. And JD, who's out there campaigning as a Catholic and a Christian, is out there not only telling lies about these very poor, vulnerable people, but justifying the lies that he's telling by saying, "Well, if I tell these lies, then we'll have a conversation about what's actually happening there," which is itself another lie <laughs> because the lies that he's telling are part of what's preventing the conversation that we need to have from happening. Uh, you know, JD is one of those people. Um, you judge him more harshly because you expect better from him. You know, Trump is the uh, scorpion that stings the frog, right? We knew he was a scorpion when he got on our backs. Um, he's, he's that guy. You don't have real high expectations for Donald Trump. But J.D. Vance is a, is a smart, experienced, highly educated guy who has shown himself care, capable of really careful, deep, humane thought, who wrote a really good book on the difficulty of leaving behind a place where there's no opportunity for you and the dysfunction of these kinds of communities. So, yeah, I judge him pretty harshly on this stuff. You know, lying is uh, is in and of itself a bad thing. It's an extraordinarily corrosive thing for the institutions and politics of a free society. And he right now has decided to, um, you know, he's tired of being the sil silver medalist on the platform there and going for the gold when it comes to being dishonest. And um, I just find that uh, very, very difficult to take and very difficult to defend. Okay, so just to be clear, when I said when I voiced a modicum of in, of skepticism about the worst person out there, that was not me saying he's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So, well, I, oh, I, I suppose we're drawing a circle around certain people that I don't really count as being in public life here, sort of you know, Nick Fuentes types. And right. So that, like I mean, that. that's, that's what I was going to go for is like, you need an X, Y axis kind of thing about like, like relevance and or, or maybe it's like a bunch of different like relevance should know better and person and, and level of responsibility. Right. Because like Laura Loomer, I think, is probably a worse person than, than J.D. Vance. Um, but then again, my expectations for her are so low that it's kind of an apples and oranges kind of thing. So you, you anticipated part of my question, which was the. Was Vance's argument that he needs to push this stuff out there to advance, um, so to speak, the conversation about all of these immigrants and uh, are the pro not the immigrants, but the problems that these immigrants bring to this community and whatnot. I, I would find that a, a not satisfactory, but a, a, an argument worth engaging with if he gave any indication that he meant it sincerely rather than as something to say to get through an interview. You know, I mean, he, it's one of those things he says, sort of like, I would have asked for a different slate of electors, you know, on January 6th. 
kills enough time that, you know, asked and answered counselor, and then he just moves on. And it's not a serious answer, but it serves a serious purpose, which is to sort of get through the interview and and have something to say. I read an article one time, this guy, Jonas something or other, um, the subject was lying for justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I remember the, uh, it just made me think of it actually, was the, you were talking about the environmentalists, mm-hmm. right? And uh, going out and presenting uh, either a distorted or actively dishonest or kind of alarmist case for things, the rationale being, well, this is a really important issue and people can't be trusted to uh, dig through the nuance and make judgments themselves. So we have to mislead them to the right position. Right. I think that's, um, I think it's just ethically wrong. There's, you know, there's a very limited scope for ethical misdirection and usually has to do with things like war and espionage and things like that. But I also think it's just functionally wrong. I don't think you actually end up getting the policies you want, the consensus you want. Um, I mean, has the environmental movement since the 70s and 80s really achieved what it wanted to achieve? There's no consensus out there. Everyone's saying, OK, well, it's really time for us to start driving electric cars and moving into densely populated cities so that we can cut our energy footprint because of global warming. Um, it's ended up making the issue that much more divisive. And they've undermined the credibility of institutions that actually deserve a little more credibility than they have. You know, I, I've written a lot about climate change and climate policy. I wrote this little pamphlet for CEI about the climate movement as a, as a religious phenomenon, you know, the kind of weird cult of it. And we went to the UN climate panel in Scotland and all that stuff. It's a real issue. I'm, I'm kind of a lot more proactive on climate stuff, I think, and open to a more proactive policy than a lot of conservatives and libertarians are. But the way that it's been presented by its advocates, by its alleged champions over the year, has really undermined the advocacy of it. And so now they're right about one thing, which is that you can't really trust people to spend a lot of their lives digging through the nuance. There is such a thing as rational ignorance. Um, where your particular actions are not going to have any huge effect on climate policy or the climate for that matter. So why bother reading 50 papers on everything or 50 articles? But um, but the way that's played out isn't that they've stampeded people into the right position. It's they've given people who are inclined to be skeptical reason just to say, well, these guys lie about everything. They present an alarmist case for everything. Here's them saying why they're presenting an alarmist case for stuff and making a case for misleading us so we can just discount them. And so when someone like you or me or uh, someone else who wants to talk in a more serious way about immigration, and I, you know, I tend to support a more restrictionist view of immigration in some ways and a more liberal view in some other ways. But um, when you go out there and say, well, no, this cat eating thing isn't happening, but here are some problems that are associated with that. Here are some things we really need to talk about. People are just going to say, well, yeah, but it's all lies. It's about the cat eating and also the crime wave that isn't happening. Uh, there's all this stuff about, you know, crimes out of control in, uh, in Springfield. But if you look at their actual crime rates, you you know, for a lot of categories, they're lower than they were in 2016, 2017. Some things are higher. I think their overall crime index is up a little bit, but not in any kind of dramatic way. So I don't think you end up normally getting the policies you want. I mean, I have this whole little speech on this that I won't go into right now, but on the plague of cleverness of people who think that, you know, they can just do this clever thing to, uh, you know, make an end run around the necessity of engaging in ordinary persuasion and argumentation and compromise and all that stuff. And it just never works. People aren't as clever as they think they are. Uh, even J.D. Vance, who's a very clever guy, isn't as clever as he thinks he is. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm with you on this. I, I, I think, I mean, this is one of my peeves about the the extremist rhetoric debate thing that's happening right now, where the Trump people want to say, Calling Trump a threat to democracy um, invites these assassination attempts. And, you know, so far, one of the two assassination attempts, you can make a colorable argument that that's true because the second guy over the weekend clearly was part had partisan sort of anti-Trump stuff going on. I'm not saying also clearly a crackpot. I'm clearly a crackpot, right. But I'm saying like, like there's actually not even that level of evidence about the guy from Butler, PA, right? And it's just like he wanted to kill somebody famous and the most famous person he could figure out was going to be nearby. So that's why he picked Trump. But I, you know, you and I are old enough to remember, you know, how much ink we spilled going after the people who wanted to blame Sarah Palin for the Gabby Givers shooting. And this is not an argument to say people should be cavalier in the language that they choose and that the people should not catastrophize, that people should feel free to catastrophize. I don't think that at all. At the same time, actual claims that have uh, a basis in truth of objective, verifiable fact are defensible. And so saying that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy 
is a defensible truth claim <laughs> because he tried to steal an election. And Donald Trump goes around saying all the time that if Harris is elected, America will be over, right? She'll destroy America. He's got no fact for that. And Trump doesn't say, you know, Trump gave this great interview the, uh, on Monday where he's talked to Fox Digital and he said, it's outrageous. The language they're using is getting me shot at when they, they should really be using that language against Kamala Harris, right? <laughs> so he's not actually against catastrophizing and extremist rhetoric, insightful rhetoric. He just thinks it shouldn't be used about him. It should be used about his opponents. Yeah, I'd like to ask him if he ever has thought, I know he's just incapable of this kind of introspection, but I remember him at, at some of the, the rallies and events offering to pay legal fees for his supporters if they would assault people who were disrupting them. And uh, I wonder if, he, I mean, he's just too dumb to understand that he's contributing to a culture of normalizing violence that's going to come back and bite him because he's one of, you know, two candidates. I mean, we, we always have to deal with just the crazy American thing, which is that we're a well-armed large country full of madmen and stuff like this is going to happen from time to time. Um, it's actually pretty rare to get someone who is really programmatic, who is a pretty successful or nearly successful assassin of someone like that. You know, Booth certainly was. Um, Oswald probably was. But, you know, like Hinckley was just a crackpot. He was just, you know, he's people talking to him through his two, two fillings and trying to impress Jodie Foster and all that crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, the, both of the women who tried to shoot Gerald Ford were really just crackpots. One of them was a Manson family person and the other was uh, some radical feminist kook who, who had some other problems. You know, there were it was it was tamped down and kind of kept quiet for good reason. But there apparently there were a number of, you know, semi-serious um, assassination attempts or plots in the Obama years. And uh, no, nothing that got close, you know, there's no bullet nick in his ear or anything like that. I don't want to make a false comparison there. But if you dig into things like this, you'll often find that they're just, just people who are just nuts. Like, uh, you know, I've written a lot about these um, abortion clinic bombers and people who've killed people at abortion clinics. And some of them are, you know, serious, committed pro-lifers. And some of them have like these weird conspiracy theories about how the Catholic Church is using fiat currency to secretly run the uh, world from behind the scenes. And therefore, they're going to shoot some abortionist even though the Catholic Church is anti-abortion. And you dig into it and you just, oh, this person's schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just what it is. This person has a non-integrated uh, way of looking at the world and understanding it. And this guy, um, you know, who was, who was trying to pop Trump down in, uh, in Palm Beach is, uh, you know, your, your classic mall ninja type who's trying to get himself sent to Ukraine. And I guess went to Ukraine and I'm going to go recruit people in Afghanistan and uh, we're going to fight the war. This person who's got a real sense of... Um, drama about himself reminded me a little of ross perot remember when he tried to stage that uh you know rescue of the uh, pow's he allegedly knew about in, in vietnam so if you gave a guy like this a lot of money he, be, he ends up becoming someone like that but he doesn't have a lot of money so he ended up becoming who he is the shooter in las vegas actually seemed to have been from what we know about him kind of a similar kind of character in some ways um, just some you know megalomaniacal sense of self-importance although we don't really know a lot about him unfortunately um that's uh, that was going to remain a mystery i think So um, one of the things I've heard from a bunch of people, I can't quite get why I sh I was asked, I I've been asked to apologize for complaining about the bomb threats at the schools, because now we know that they were phoned in from abroad for the most part, according to Mike DeWine. I don't get why I should like people like you should take your tweets down or whatever. I don't get it. To be honest, I mean, just to be bluntly honest, it's 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 as if people think that okay, so that these calls would have spontaneously generated for this random town in Ohio, even if Trump and Vance hadn't said this stuff. And I, I don't I don't quite get the logic of it, but there's a lot of that kind of thing going on where people are chasing reasons to defend the lie. And this gets back to your original point, which is I think that the plague of cleverness. Is really just a, a sort of communications version of Hayek's fatal conceit, right? The idea that you can craft craft lies in a way so clever that all the bank shots and all the falsification that they're going to be subjected to can survive and you can shape people's mental space successfully. Right. Because you're a 99th degree black belt esoteric Straussian. Right. And, and, and we both know that Donald Trump is deeply fluent in, in, in 
in next level drowsiness. But you know, I mean, with the, 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 the bomb flat threats coming in from abroad doesn't really surprise me at all. You know, there are, as we know, yeah, I actually have something I want to differ with you on just a little sure. bit, where I think you have been way too generous to these schmucks on the Russian payroll um, <laughs> in the uh, in the right wing influencer world. Um, there's no way these people didn't know uh, where this money was coming from. These people are not that secretive. They're not that smart. But again, even if they weren't, even if we take your generous mm-hmm. and charitable view of these things, there are people, you know, in Russia, in Iran, in China, in North Korea, although it's a less important country, who obviously want to do what people have always done when their enemy is a free society and their closed society, which is use the stress points of a free society, things like elections and the free press and media and stuff like that, to try to undermine faith in its institutions and, and those sorts of things. And Trump and Vance have made themselves very, very amenable to being used in that way. And uh, now I don't think J.D. Vance is secretly getting paid by Russians to um, try to undermine the case for helping the Ukrainians defend themselves. I don't think Trump is secretly getting paid by anybody, although if anybody were getting secretly paid, I would just assume it would be Mm -hmm. Trump because that's kind of his style. Um, But I don't think that's probably the case. They know that they're being useful and they don't mind being useful when it comes to undermining faith in our elections and other institutions because they want to see those institutions undermined as well. They think that they are corrupt. They think that they are uh, too liberal and too accommodating and not giving them the sort of power that they need to enact the kinds of policies the country needs. So I think they do bear some some positive responsibility there for this kind of cooperation. And it is cooperation. It's not necessarily corrupt cooperation. It's not cooperation that someone is being bribed to do. Um, but there is something in it for them, of course, because they do want to hold office. They do want political power. So, um, yeah, I don't think that it's the, the people complaining about the bomb threats that um, that owe the world an apology, but I didn't think apologies add up to very much. Switching gears a little bit. So, you know, one of the things which has been part of your writing for a while now, going back to the stuff about Garbit and whatever that town was called, um, I saw some people were, were cross about how, you know, Rod Dreher said something along the lines of, you know, elite liberals would never mock working class black people, but you can mock working class, working class, uh, white people the way Kevin Williamson does in this piece, yada, 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 yada. I find, you know, I like, I like Rod, but I find that logic really kind of weird, you know, which, where's the complaint? Is the complaint that you should be allowed to mock working class black people or that you should also have an identity type, identity politics, protective coding, around the white working class. I mean, it's one of these things where it it feels more like cultural envy of the cultural power of the left rather than an actual argument for what one should say or not say. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about all that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's an infamous racial epithet that nice white people like us will go way out of our way to avoid saying or even referencing. Uh, which you can tell from the way I just introduced it. It's it's an unsayable word. But if you're black, you can say that. And some people complain about that and think that's weird or hypocritical or that's a word that shouldn't be said by anybody. But I think it's entirely appropriate that different kinds of people have you know certain license to talk about different things in different ways. And I feel that when it comes to four white people, I can say whatever the hell I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these are my people. I am a redneck American. Uh, I was actually publicly called a redneck by a screaming panhandler in a Starbucks as recently as yesterday. So um, I feel like um, I'm allowed to do this. Um, so, yeah, I get this a lot. Like, oh, you know, someone actually in a dispatch comment the other day gave me, uh, you know, was trying to give me some grief about that. You know, it's reeks of coastal elitism. I'm like, Dude, I'm from Lubbock, Texas, and I live in central Appalachia. Uh, I am I am far from the East Coast centers of urbanity and all that stuff. Yes, I've lived in New York. Yes, I've lived briefly in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but no, um, you know, I am from this kind of background. Uh, you know, J.D. and I actually come from, from very similar you know, kind of socioeconomic situations. Although we'll point out the boy, the Vances were a little wealthier than the Williams since they were actually relatively, relatively high income people um, for their um, for their context. So, no, screw these people. I'll talk about who I want to. I mean, the truth is I will mock poor black people and poor Latinos and poor Asians and 
rich black people and rich Latinos and rich Asians and all sorts of people because I'm comfortable doing that. Uh, you know, I go out and I write about what's going on in the world and I write about my impressions of it and what I see and what I feel about it. And um, you know what it kind of does? Um, people don't sort of understand sometimes. Like, I remember I read something some years ago. I was, I was in a situation admitting that being um, the only white person in a, in a situation of a, a whole lot of non-white people around was something that made me uncomfortable. I don't think that is something that speaks well of me. Uh, you know, people have uh, racial sensitivities. People have, you know, different racial buttons that get pushed. People have different class buttons that get pushed. I remember talking to a friend of mine a while back. We were driving to a place and she said, this is a bad neighborhood. I said, this is not a bad neighborhood. It's just a poor neighborhood. There's a difference between a bad neighborhood and a poor neighborhood. But for her, you know, it's hard to, hard to really tell the difference. Um, but I tried to be honest in, you know, in my reporting, including my reporting about myself and what I, you know, see and feel. Um, I often write about, you know, kind of petty resentments that I have or things that I think don't necessarily reflect well on me. Uh, I try to, you know, I try to write what I see and what I experience, including, you know, what I what I feel about it sometimes, um, because sometimes my perspective ends up be becoming one of the things that I that I write about. So, um, yeah, I'm not um, I'm not a super saintly person. I wish I were a, a better sort of person. But sometimes I have uh, feelings and sensibilities and sensitivities that um, that aren't necessarily all that admirable. And I think it's dishonest when uh, reporters who write about themselves or columnists who write about themselves, um, you know, go out of their way to present themselves as these, you know, paragons of virtue who've never had uh, an improper thought or anything like that in their lives. Who've, uh, you know, never been drunk, never been arrested, never made a bad decision, never made a uh, phone call they wish they hadn't made at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm just not that guy. I have... I have lots of regrets in life. And sometimes I write about them. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think I agree with you entirely. Like you can offer criticisms about something being unduly harsh or one sided and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying you were, but like those are legitimate criticisms to make. They're not the same criticisms as saying something's untrue. And I know I keep coming back to this, but like truth telling, even if it's just the truth as you see it, as long as it's not some sort of Robert Reich, you know, fabulism where it's true because I believe it's true, right? That kind of thing. If it's, if it's a sincere effort of telling a truth as you, you know, the, uh, uh, that you believe is actually true, that is always a defense. Now, sometimes it, you know, you know the stuff like, does this dress make me look fat kind of thing? It is not, sometimes it is not a sufficient defense, <laughs> but um, it is, you know, like, and that's the thing that just drives me crazy about so much of our politics right now is, you know, as you know, I've been obsessed with sort of lefty postmodernism stuff forever. My problem with the right these days, I mean, among other things, is that it's, it's got a, if you can't beat them, join them issue, right? It was like the, the, you know, when Tawana, when, when Al Sharpton, you know, was told allegedly, this is quoting from memory, you know, that, uh, the Tawana Brawley thing was fake. He allegedly said, um, it doesn't matter. We're building a movement or words to that effect. That's the lying for justice thing that I have a problem with, with Vance's defense, right? Is that he is, you know, he is with a wink and a nod. And I understand that people are thinking, say that he was being quoted out of context, but you know, when he talks about creating stories to, to call attention to something, he is essentially conceding that like the attention is more important than the truth. And that I just find unforgivable. There's also the, you know, the, the where's the omelet issue, right? You know, when um, George Orwell was told by some Stalinist that you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, he asked, well, where's the omelet? Right. <laughs> you know, so where, where is this movement that, that J.D. Vance and these guys are building? Because um, it looks to me like they're about to lose a presidential election. They've destroyed the Republican Party. Uh, they have turned the conservative movement from being the dominant force in American politics to being a minority tendency. I don't know that they actually are building. Um, if they are building a movement, it's not a movement that can um, deliver long-term electoral victories, or more importantly, they can deliver um, substantial, durable policy changes. You know, if you look at, um, I was, I was, I was, I don't normally shout at the television or shout at the uh, internet or whatever I'm doing when I was watching the debate the other day and Trump was saying to Harris, you know, you were in there three and a half years and you haven't done any of this stuff. Fair enough criticism. But I kind of wanted her to say, 
you were there for four. <laughs> and what did you do? Uh, nothing. Um, you know, he came in and his big issues were um, immigration and uh, trade, and he really accomplished very little on any of those things. He signed a perfectly conventional Republican tax bill and um, and then basically tweeted until they kicked him off Twitter. So I don't really see this as being um, as being a particularly impressive omelet. Uh, when it comes to, to policy stuff, even if you assume and, and obviously Vance is smarter than Trump, Vance is more serious than Trump and Vance has something more like a substantive policy agenda, although I have talked to him about it a little bit. and He is still pretty fuzzy on some of these things. Um, he reminds me a little bit, no surprise, of, of, of Michael Brendan Daugherty, who um, can be you know, a scathing critic of the excesses of um, kind of culture of capitalism. But then when you ask him, what do you want to do? And, uh, you know, I want uh, and it it gets pretty fuzzy pretty quickly. And it has to do mainly with the, um, you know, status assigned to various groups. I want us to listen less to the bankers and more to the, you know, working people in the factories. And um, as though that were an answer for the um, for 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 a policy question. And um, but assuming that Vance has a more serious policy agenda at some point. I don't think he's doing the things that are going to get it done. I think he's doing the things that are going to ensure that it never gets done. I had missed this. I guess it was on the All In podcast, that David Sachs guy or something. Vance was asked about Pence, and I I learned about this. It was a very good editorial over from our friends at National Review, um, where they, among the things they dinged Vance for was slandering, you know, Mike Pence. And Pence, he said that, you know, he he did his, I would have floated fake electors, you know, blah, 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 all that nonsense, which I think is, is just on the merits nonsense that fancies, or I shouldn't say it's nonsense. It's a lie. Um, and it's a dangerous one. And it's why it's legitimate to say these guys are a threat to democracy. Cause basically what he's saying is I would have allowed for fraudulent electors to try and steal an election. And, and he thinks that's an okay answer. But then he went on to say, look, I think the idea, and I'm quoting this, you know, from memory, but it's close. Um, I think the idea that the difference, the reason why Mike Pence isn't supporting Donald Trump having to do with not January 6th just isn't true. I think if Donald Trump in, came out in favor of a nuclear war with Russia, Mike Pence would be leading the charge supporting Donald Trump. I found that in some way, I mean, look, I, I think in terms of actual venality and evil, the stuff that he's unleashed with the Haitian immigrant community is worse for all sorts of like logical reasons. But the glibness with which he can basically say anybody who disagrees with me is, is less honorable and a warmonger who wants to kill millions of people just to satisfy bloodlust in some ways is a more grotesque version of, of, fa- of, of false witness, of bearing false witness particularly given that it's in defense of saying that January 6th didn't matter and that, that, you know, the hang Mike Pence stuff didn't matter. It's just particularly grotesque. I guess the question is, I I feel you inching toward my estimate of his despair. Yeah, no, it gets me closer. I will admit. (laughs) Um, But the question is, is like, we were both willing to stipulate he's smart. And I think we're both willing to stipulate that the strategy without bells and whistles is to own a certain segment of the Republican party that is hyper MAGA and hyper loyal. And he wants to be the heir apparent of Trumpism. Does that work? Do you think that like, let's say Trump departs this mortar coil or loses the election. Do you think all of those people who love Trump are just going to line up behind JD Vance? No, I don't think that, um, Trumpism really survives Trump. I think it really is just, just a personality cult. Um, now, I, I say that with some trepidation because Trump is a lazy, stupid demagogue, and it's entirely possible that there would be some equally gifted but smart and driven demagogue who would do Trumpism, but, you know, effectively and worse. So far, you know, that's that's not been the case, but that doesn't mean it can't be the case. It's a big country full of talented people. Somebody wants to pick up that crown and uh, and run with it. Um, but no, I don't think that the Trump movement really falls in anyone else's lap because Trump is uh, he is sui generis. You know, I think it would um, it would take someone who is at least of equal celebrity status. And you and I have talked about this a little bit, and we both talked about it independent of one another, that um, the dynamic of celebrity in the Trump movement is really, I think, underestimated. You know, Trump is a, a real celebrity. He's not like a Taylor Swift level celebrity, but he's from that genre of celebrity. 
he's not, I'm, you know, on Fox News sometimes, or you see me on cable shows, or I used to be a senator, kind of level of famous. And uh, that kind of celebrity has a real ability to warp uh, people and institutions and really change the way people behave. You know, I used to write uh, movie reviews once upon a time, so I've, you know, I've interviewed some, some, some famous actors and actresses and things. And um, you put Clint Eastwood or Gwyneth Paltrow in a room or Brad Pitt in a room, and it changes uh, how people how people stand. Uh, you know, when it, Clint Eastwood is like the sun in a room full of sunflowers. Uh, you know, at, at three thousand years old, or however he was, old <laughs> he was last time I saw him, it was he was in his late eighties, I think. And uh, the last time I saw him, the one time I saw him um, at an event, and people just subtly turn to face him when he comes into the room. Um, that kind of celebrity is really, really powerful in a way that political ideology isn't. Political ideology is powerful in a different kind of way because it can last a long time and can be wielded by lots of different people in lots of different situations, which is why, you know, liberalism has been so successful, why communism was such a powerful force and why um, sort of demagogic movements associated with particular people like Ross Perot or George Wallace back when or you David Duke in his lesser kind of way um, tend not to get very far beyond the particular demagogue except to the extent that they are transferable to a ready-made kind of ideology. You know, David Duke and his racism, um, Wallace and whatever Wallaceism was. Actually, it's kind of a lot like Trumpism. I think there's a pretty straight line from, from Wallace to Trump. But it's not really very, you know, the, uh, David Duke, you can put his program into a couple of words, right? He's a white supremacist. He wants white people in charge and black people subjugated. Um, you know, Trump, Sort of, well, we'd like to have higher tariffs on flip flops that are made in China because we think somehow this will contribute to the reindustrialization of Rust Belt cities in Ohio. And, uh, you know, they never quite get there. They never quite get there in terms of a policy program, a kind of, you know, this and that and therefore this. Um, it's, it's, it's really remarkable that they've had all these years now of trying to develop a real ideology. They've had a decade of trying to build a real program around this guy and his affect, and they can't do it. And of course, that's because he sabotages it because he hates ideas. And the idea of, you know, being hemmed in by some sort of consistent set of principles is just anathema to him. That's not how he operates. Yeah. The only thing, the only place I kind of push back on that is that I think we're both right about him being the rules of celebrity applying to him rather than the rules of politics applying, applying to him. But I, I, I think you're right that he was, you know, a, was several rungs down on the celebrity scale from Taylor Swift when he entered politics. Now that he's been president for four years and, and the head of the Republican Party for close to a decade, he's probably got the highest name ID of anybody in the world, including Taylor Swift, I would think. Maybe not among top five. Maybe there's more parity among affluent populations. But like, I bet you there are people in some pretty rural parts of, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or, you know, rural Brazil who still know the name Donald Trump who might not know the name Taylor Swift. But the thing is, he's, he's kept the, the protective coding of, of the rules of celebrity around him, even though he was president, because he behaved more like a celebrity than as a president when he was president, right? I mean, he was like commenting on his presidency while he was president, you know, like, which is weird. Yeah, there's a, there's something to that. I was just thinking, uh, you know, in 2012, he was thinking about running for president. And uh, so his people called me. I was still at National Review at that point and said, hey, this is blah, 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 blah. It was Donald Trump's office. I don't think it was John Barron, by the way. <laughs> a little aside here, but every time I think of that, you know, these guys complain about being called weird. Donald Trump has a son, his youngest son, who's named after the imaginary friend he invented to lie to the New York Post about his sex life. That's weird. That's weird. <laughs> That's, I mean, imaginary friends for guys that age are pretty weird in general. Son named after imaginary friend is pretty weird. Lying to the New York Post about your sex life through your imaginary friend. Very weird. All those things together is a big potpourri of weirdness. But anyway, when, when the guy called me and said, hey, can you, do you want to do an interview with Donald Trump? He's going to run for president. I laughed, of course. And then I thought, well, yeah, I'd love to. This will be a great story. It's a thing that's never going to happen, of course. I mean, maybe he'll try to do something. He's, he's played around with that before. But it'll be hilarious. And also, a gazillion people will read it who wouldn't normally read, uh, you know, National Review or wouldn't normally read my stuff at the time because they don't read about politics. But they'll certainly read about a guy like Donald Trump because he's an interesting character. 
and uh, of course he he uh, decided not to before we could get it scheduled and uh, I to this day very much regret not having um, pursued that harder and made it happen before he uh, pulled out in 12. Well my um part of one of my Trump stories I'd never met the guy I've only gotten one note from him thanking me for a column he didn't understand. But, I never got one of it. <laughs> but I think it was McKay Coppins. He wrote a piece early on about the, which was the, I can't remember if you were in it, but I was in it of like the pundits responsible for goading Trump into running for president. And apparently I had said in a, in a New York Post column that, only Trump and George Pataki do not make the threshold for me to support them. Anybody else in the field I could tolerate over the Democrat. And, um, uh, and apparently Trump slumped over and said to somebody, why don't they respect me? And this was in the context of the, these great chain of events like Trump mocking him. I mean, the Obama mocking him at the White House Correspondents' Dinner and all these kinds of things that goaded him into sort of, now they'll respect me, you know, kind of uh, thing. So um, anyway, it's a, it's, it's, I'm a footnote to a footnote in history. The man who couldn't afford a pair of pants. That's right. That's still comes up from time to time. All right. So Broadening out, um, you have, I believe, remained fairly silent in this, I will say, exhausting and very frustrating, and I don't particularly enjoy this conversation, but this argument about who you're going to vote for. I know you're not voting for Donald Trump. The, this is very clear. Um, I don't, I don't want to ask you who you're going to vote for, except to say that how do you think about this question and whether it matters in the way that so many other people do. I mean, like there are people who think, you know, that David French approach is the only way to go. You know, we love David, you know, I've had my disagreements with him. There are other people who think that revealing your vote doesn't, is not necessary, whatever. I mean, we can run through all the different oh, versions yeah, well, I've of this. Actually, I've actually been pretty open about not voting. So um, I haven't voted in almost, I guess this will be 20 years this year that I haven't Including voted. in elect- local elections? Yeah, the last election I voted for in, I want to say, was 2004. Um, I may be misremembering, but I think it was 2004 was the last time I voted. So, you know, I've got um, my political personality. I've got the little angel that's uh, Dwight Eisenhower on, on one shoulder and the little devil that's Albert J. Nock on the other shoulder. And um, when it comes to voting, uh, I think the, the Nockian devil um, uh, has the has a louder voice there. Uh, you know, I've mostly lived in places, of course, like you, where my vote's not going to matter. Um, one way or the other, you know, Texas or, um, or New York in uh, the presidential elections. Although I guess I lived in Nevada for a while where that was a, it was a swing state, although I wasn't there during the uh, presidential election. You know, the voting thing is um, is a big part of what I call the politics of cooties. So it's not about um, are you going to contribute to the outcome of this election? Because most of you aren't. Uh, most of us aren't. It's just not going to miss. That's not how it works. Um, but it's I need you to pick a flag and salute that flag. Um, now, I think there's a long tradition of journalists either not voting or not talking about who they voted for. I think you're absolutely right when you say that when you talk about this stuff in public, it sort of subtly forces you to get recruited onto a team and start being an apologist uh, for your chosen candidate. You know, I'd be perfectly uh, happy to say that if, you know, if I had voted in 16 and I voted for Ted Cruz, I would have said, you know, yes, I voted for Ted Cruz. My guy's a schmuck, but he's the schmuck that I chose. And, um, and, and go on from there. I don't think I would have felt the need to defend the cruisiness of, of Ted Cruz. And uh, although I think that he's... He's been made a lot worse by the Trump years than he was before. He used to be a pretty, pretty decent, respectable politician, I think, in some ways. Yeah, I think it's um, the way people get demanding about it. Like, you must pick a side. It's a binary thing. Well, it's not really a binary thing, actually. There are all sorts of ways to approach an election. And saying no, uh, that I'm not going to vote for either one of these shocks is, um, is a perfectly valid response. So I will vote when there's someone out there I want to vote for. 
You know, I think if um, if Ben Sass had been on a ballot or you know Mitt Romney in 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 sixteen, I might have uh, I might have gone out there and done it. I'm not really ideologically anti-voting. Even P.J. O'Rourke, who had a book called "Don't Vote," who just encourages the bastards. Um, didn't really take a seriously anti-voting stand. It was more of a rhetorical and, and humorous thing with him. But no, I just I, I'll, I'll vote when there's something I want to vote for, I suppose, or something I feel very strongly about. Um, or in a situation like in a local election where I think that I might make a difference. Um, that's something I probably should be rethinking because, you know, after having lived in a lot of big cities for a long time, I now live in a pretty small municipality where um, that might actually that might actually make a difference on something that I care about, although I'm pretty uh, not very plugged into to local politics where I live. Um, so I'll uh, maybe revisit that. I um yeah, I just don't want to um, I don't want to get recruited in that way and I don't want to set myself up for it. Uh, but also I just profoundly dislike um, both of these candidates. And the Trump thing has been great for me. It's been liberating in a sense that um, whatever vestigial attachment I had to the Republican Party is just gone. And I don't feel any need to uh, sort of corporately defend them. Yeah, some Republicans are right about some things. They generally have better views about certain things than the Democrats do. Although now the Democrats generally have better views about some things that I care about than Republicans do. Uh, at the median, sort of like trade, I think the Democrats are currently probably a little bit better on uh, than, than the median Republican is. At least they are hostile, but not as hostile. You know, the first vote I ever cast in a presidential election was 92. I voted for Andre Maru, the uh, Libertarian Party candidate, who turned out, I guess, to be sort of a creep, mm-hmm. uh, which is I didn't really know that until I mean, actually you might have mentioned it on a podcast. And I went and looked it up. He's had some, some some issues since 1992, I suppose. You know, I always thought of myself principally as a small L libertarian who voted sometimes for the Libertarian Party and sometimes voted for the uh, Republicans. I became more conservative over time, I think, um, in some ways. I have George Will on the mind very much right now because I'm going to be, uh, well, you're going to be there too, I think, at the uh, at the Simon Award dinner where I'm, I'm, I'm introducing him, and um, which I'm very pleased about. But um, what he calls the conservative sensibility is something that I think has become more important to me um, in the sense that I'm just increasingly skeptical of all radical schemes, including right-wing radical schemes. Um, I'm increasingly skeptical of all giant, big, sweeping uh, political and social changes. Uh, People saying we're going to, you know, take this thing that's been this way for a very long time and smash it and change it and reshape it in in the way we want. Um, There was a time when I was more sympathetic to that, when I say, yeah, let's scrap the tax code. Let's close down all the public schools. Let's get rid of uh, uh, this, that and the other thing. And um, and while that survives, I think rhetorically, I try to resist it. Um, although I do have a weakness for that sort of thing that I really have to be conscious about. But yeah, I'm, I'm certainly more of a more of a conservative in the sense of that I'm, I'm just suspicious of, of big ideas and big changes. Um, that's a long way from the question you asked me about voting, but I'm not going to vote this year. Yeah. No, um, I'm not even registered, man. I'm trying to avoid jury duty. When you say you really don't like either of these candidates, I, I, I'm very similar place. I'm, 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 I'm PJ O'Rourke on this, right? It's like Trump's unacceptable outside of normal parameters and Harris is unacceptable within normal parameters. I can make an argument. Some of it is probably wish casting that the conservative movement and the Republican party will come out much better and healthier after a Harris term than a Trump term. Always better in opposition. Yeah. When also, particularly when you have to purge a lot of bad ideas and, um, very hard to purge bad ideas when the, avatar of the bad ideas is the president of the United States. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wrote this column that uh, greatly angered some people um, in sort of pro Liz Cheney land where I, and I like Liz Cheney a lot. I respect what she's done, right? In many ways, she's been a more of a profile of courage than a, a lot of other anti-Trump famous Republicans because she actually had something to lose, but, um, yeah, and lost it and lost it. Right. Say what you will, but Romney, I think he's an honorable and decent man. And he was right for calling out Trump and saying, he's not going to vote for him, but his political career was over is over. Right. You know, so like, it's, it's just a different thing. Regardless, I made the point that, you know, I actually think you could, if Liz's argument is, is that all that really matters is defeating Trump, 
right? And that it's, so it's all about strategy now. It's not about feels or cooties or or vibes or any of that kind of stuff. It's just like, practically, what are you going to do to help Trump lose? And I get that. And I respect that. I guess my, but my, my objection is, is that I actually, if you think about what the last persuadable voters might look like, Liz Cheney would probably win over on net more gettable, you know, anti-Trump right wingers. If she said, you know, Harris is really terrible, right? Not, I have, I have my disagreements and I'm encouraged by her moving to the center on these issues and blah, 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 blah. But basically just said, look, Harris is not good. And, um, and her views in 2019 were totally unacceptable. But even if I, you know, but as terrible as I think she might be, the stakes are just so high, it's still worth voting for Kamala Harris over Donald Trump. And I think, because what people want is the permission to stay in a tribe, even if they're going to throw the chieftain out. And when you tell people you have, you not only do you have to stop being a conservative and stop being a Republican, you also have to throw out Donald Trump, or you also have to throw out Donald, you have to throw out Donald Trump, and you have to be expelled from the tribe. That's asking too much for a lot of these people. But giving people a permission structure to sort of stay in the tribe, but get rid of Trump, I think would be more persuasive, and yet you just don't see a lot of that. Yeah, I think they got it right with the bumper sticker in the uh, Edwards versus David Duke election, where the, the the famous bumper sticker that said "Vote for the crook, it's important." Right. I think that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wish I had thought of that. That's right. Yeah. Vote for the vote for the doofus from California. It's important. Could have saved David French some uh, some some ink. He could just written that. <laughs> uh, the problem, of course, is that um, we're going to get the worst case outcome, which is it's going to be a close election. Mm-hmm. And a close election either way is just going to make things worse. If I could wave a magic wand and pick my electoral outcome, this will get some hate mail. Um, not only would I would I throw the election to Harris, I would have the Republicans lose in about a 49 mm-hmm. state landslide. I think they need just a biblical ass whipping. Um, and it's the only thing that's going to kind of sober them up. You know, I, I wrote about this in a column the other day, in, uh, and the, the metaphor I used was um, getting sober in jail. <laughs> which um, is not a complete stretch of imagination. (laughs) And, uh, you know, they need an experience like that that makes you go, dear God, what have I done? I have screwed this up badly and I must amend my ways. And it has to be bad enough that uh, when they drop the charges, you still uh, you still try to stay on the straight and narrow to abuse the uh, the metaphor. Son. So, um, yeah, they need uh, they need to get beaten badly. If there were a normie Republican and it were the other way around and, you know, the Democrats had nominated some Sanders type or something like that, I'd love to see them losing a 49 state landslide, too. There's much in their world that needs reform as well. And they've got a lot of sobering up to do themselves. But they seem to be on the path toward relative sobriety. Um, You know, they had a chance to nominate a crazy person the last time around. They nominated Joe Biden instead, who's there's a lot of things about him you can say. I don't like Joe Biden. I think he's a profoundly dishonest and gross kind of politician. And every time I hear someone say, well, Joe Biden, you know, he was a very decent guy. No, he's not. He's a terrible human (laughs) being. He's at least as dishonest as Donald Trump is. Uh, spent years lying about his wife being killed by a drunk driver and little baby children and little baby daughter. And, uh, and a guy who can lie about something like that, that cold heartedly is a psychopath. But politically, he's not a crazy person. You know, he is from the more moderate side of the Democratic Party. And Harris is not the most left wing person they could have nominated. Um, you know, there are crazier people out there than Harris. And she certainly is at least talking as though she understands that she's not running for a Senate seat from California, that she's running for president of the United States and that there's going to be Republicans in the world after the election. And they're going to be people who are not median California Democratic primary voter in the country after the election. And she seems to be prepared to talk to those people in a more sensible, you know, sober kind of way. I hope it sticks. If she uh, if she wins, uh, she could really do herself and her party and more important, the country, a great big favor. Um, she's she's disappointed me already, of course, in a lot of ways, just in that she's had so many opportunities just to be kind of frank and honest about things. Like when they were hitting her about, you know, changing her views on this, that and the other. I mean, she really could have just said, you know, Running for president is different from running from a California Senate seat. And I've been vice president for a while and I've been campaigning for president now and it's changed my views on some things. And I also realized that I live in a country where not everyone has exactly my view on stuff and the compromise consensus is necessary. Yes, I want to win Pennsylvania. 
and that is um, that is changing how I've thought about the oil and gas industry and fracking and that stuff. Um, but that's actually what you do in politics is you try to build consensus on things that you can compromise on. Uh, you know, something like abortion, which I hate her view on abortion. You know, I'm 100 percent on the other side. She couldn't really compromise on that in the same way as someone who's you know pro-life. Well, I was going to say that, but apparently pro-lifers can't compromise on this. So never mind. <laughs> but if there was someone who really cared about something in the Republican Party, he would find it hard to compromise on that issue. Uh, I don't expect her to compromise on the stuff that's really, you know, blood and gut stuff for uh, for Democrats. If she could, you know, just and be honest about what she's doing, about saying, look, there's a lot of people in the country who voted for Donald Trump. They elected him president in 2016. Millions of people are going to vote for him this time around. And if it were some other Republican, millions of people would vote for him, too. And he might beat me. Um, I'm saying this from the uh, from the imaginary perspective of her having won the election. Uh, but they're still here. They're still our fellow countrymen. And if we actually want to change things in a way that's not going to be completely undone by the next administration, that means getting Congress involved. That means building bipartisan consensus and um, and, and doing the, the really very difficult work of persuasion and compromise and consensus building the real politics consists of. She's barely articulate enough to say that, I think. Um, I'm not the world's most articulate person um, when it comes to talking rather than writing. And I can, I can get those words out. I don't see why she can't as well. And I kind of think the country might go, that sounds like it might not be bullshit. And um, that's refreshing. Maybe we can run with that for a little while. And then if she actually followed up on it just a little bit, just the tiniest bit. And that's been kind of disappointing, too, in that, um, you know, Biden before her and then Harris. You know, there are the, the for lack of a better descriptor, Haley Republicans out there. Uh, they're not a huge part of the Republican Party, but they are, you know, 10 to 20 percent of Republicans are deeply, deeply discomfortable, uncomfortable with Donald Trump. And some of them will, of course, um, not support him and just throw these people a little bit of a bone and say, look, you know, here's what I believe. Um, here's where we can work together. Here's some things we agree on. And this is what I want to do. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to do. But, man, she just seems incapable of doing it. Yeah. I mean, I. Don't understand why she can't memorize a handful of, I mean, I like your answers and I would prefer those to a lot, but like just passable answers to things. You know, she did that, that one-on-one -on -one interview with a Pennsylvania reporter and it, it, it was bad. I just don't get, she could be so disciplined for the debate. Just take some of those answers and, um, and update them sufficiently. Yeah, I, I had something I want to ask you before we, we wrap this up. Yeah. I know we're running a little long here. Um, I mentioned this to you the other day, but you didn't you didn't answer me. Uh, you said something that just caught my attention. Why do you dislike pumping diesel? I could swear I responded to that. Um, Maybe I missed it. So a bunch of different reasons. One, um, I hate the smell of it. Two, I would say somewhere between half and 80% of the diesel pumps that I've been to, that I've used... The handles are much dirtier, like they've got diesel fuel on them. And particularly out in rural, uh, you know, America, where I was driving with the Sprinter a bunch, a lot of them don't have the, the, th the auto stopper thing. And so I've spilled diesel on the side of the van a few times and on my feet. And once you get it all, like on your clothing, you smell like diesel forever. Um, also, maybe you can answer this question for me. So some diesel spigot right the gas spigot thing will not fit in the the tank hole for my van and it's oh it's a high speed pump and it's clearly for semis whatever right i get that fine so you know you got a semi truck you got to fill up 150 gallons or something like that fine you have different things why aren't they marked like, I can't tell you, I mean, you know, it's a real pain in the ass to pull into a gas station and like only after you've like stopped and let the dogs out and whatever, and you get down out of the thing and then you're like, ah, oh, crap, this won't fit in my gas tank. Why, why aren't they designated that way? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, normally I, I well, there are places I, I notice when it says high speed diesel because mine, it'll fit in there. And so I stopped at those places because... It goes goes more quickly. So when I was living in Dallas, I was often shocked about just how hard it was to put gas in the car. So I didn't have a to have a diesel for that whole time. Uh, most of the time, I had gasoline cars, and just so many gas stations where like you know the pumps don't work, the credit card reader doesn't work, something's wrong. Um, 
it, 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 for some reason, in Dallas, uh, which is right there on a gas pipeline, as I understand it, a gasoline pipeline, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to buy gas. Diesel can be a pain, of course, too, sometimes because there is less of it. And um, oh, do you know what I did the other day? Oh, it's actually a few months ago because I was so stupid. Do you have to put diesel exhaust fluid in your uh, in your van? I do. And it's a huge pain in the ass. OK. Yeah. So I went to a truck stop where they've got the, the DAF pumps. And uh, which is nice. You can just fill it up. And I was just tired because, as you know, I have little children and they get up at night. And sometimes I was up at 245 this morning, by the way. So I'm a little rambling. That's why. Anyway, I pulled the DAF pump off to fill up my DAF tank and I put it in my fuel tank. Uh Oh, and uh, yes. Uh oh, twenty thousand dollars. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I had to replace the whole fuel. When system. did you do this? Oh, right before um, my lab, my most recent move. I was getting my truck ready to haul stuff off across the country. Oh. And um, yeah, the good news is my Ford has a brand new fuel system in it. So. <laughs> and I, I even did everything you're supposed to do. Like as soon as I realized what I'd done, I stopped it. I didn't turn the truck on or anything. I had it hauled off um, to the place where they could pull the tank out and drop everything but apparently on the new trucks they've got this little feature it's very helpful and will destroy your engine sometimes <laughs> or destroy your fuel system if you've got the key fob on mm-hmm. you and you get like within 10 feet of the truck it'll um turn on the uh fuel pump primer oh dear to uh to prime it up a little bit so it sucked just enough of that stuff into the uh the fuel system to uh screw it up. So that was a very expensive mistake. And I felt very, very stupid. Wow. But I felt better um, when I called the tow truck guy and he was like, oh yeah, I get this like once a week. It happens all the time. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, what's wrong with you people? You can't read? I was like, there's two little holes there. They're right next to each other. Man, that sounds like a bad joke. I'm about to say that. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, the wrong, wrong Yeah, one. so for listeners who don't know, DEF, D-E-F, is the stuff that the EPA now requires of most diesel vehicles um it's just urea and water yeah it's basically calpis and what it does is it 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 makes your car less of your vehicle less efficient but it takes out more of the diesel particulates for air pollution purposes and so i don't know if this is true of your truck but it's definitely true of our van if you run out of def it's not like your car needs it the computer will start it cripples you start crippling your engine until you can basically only go five miles an hour to get to some place where you can buy the stuff. So I keep an extra five gallons of it in my toolbox. And uh, my brother-in-law in Alaska was telling me a story about how some guy, some mechanic, sold the ability to turn off the deaf thing. <laughs> and the EPA came on down on him like he was selling fentanyl and kitty porn mags and like sent him to jail. Um, so <laughs> I believe it. be aware. So this is exactly where people thought this conversation was going to go. Two real Americans <laughs> talking about the diesel engines. <laughs> With that, Kevin Williamson, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, Obviously, we're going to have you back sometimes even in, with some intentionality like today and, uh, and, and safe travels. And great piece. It was really a great piece. I did tell you in a text, the only missed opportunity in this really wonderful piece that I didn't care how long it was to read because it really was propulsively readable was low hanging fruit that with all talk about Haitian workers wanting more overtime, you didn't point out that Donald Trump wants to cut their taxes by by getting rid of taxes on overtime. But other than that. That's right. I forgot that one. That would have been a good one to get, have in there. So um, well, the nice thing about the digital world is I can, uh, I can go at it now. All right, my friend. Thanks very much. Safe travels. Say hi to the whole family, the entire brood, which we didn't talk about. My wife's going to be very cross at me about that. And, um, and I'll talk to you next time. Okay. So Kevin has left the studio. Um, I do apologize for any weird audio issues. He was doing it from a car, from his phone, because he's been traveling, obviously. Anyway, I really do highly recommend the piece. It's sort of vintage, Kevin. Um, I think the some of the responses to it are, uh, including, I, you know, I wish I'd asked him about this. Um, it kind of felt like Vance's comments last night where he's talking about bringing the tone down and not demonizing people might have actually been a result of him reading the piece. Maybe not, because he also went on to sort of make it sound like liberals are trying to murder Trump, and that proves conservatives are better, which I think is a pretty specious argument. Uh, Regardless, uh, always great to talk to Kevin, and um, 
I don't know if we kept in the, we're going to keep in the conversation about diesel. Um, but there you have it. And um, I'll see you next time. Not today, Satan. This is the podcast.